Hi, guys. Um, yeah, my name is uh, Derry Oesterk. I'm from uh, Berlin. I'm a freelancer. I do um, art direction, motion design, and some technical direction. And um, yeah, thanks to Maxon for having me here at IBC. So uh, as Babel was mentioning, uh, we'll talk about the new uh, MoGraph features. And um, yesterday, um, I did the first part of this presentation. And um, as the MoGraph features are, as the features of uh, as we have a lot of new features in R18 uh, regarding MoGraph, um, I had to split my presentation in two parts. So um, today uh, I will talk about the um, second part, or do the second part of this presentation. Uh, but first off, a little bit uh, uh, my showreel. Um, Exactly, short and sweet. Some of the stuff uh, which I did like in the recent years. So uh, let's jump back uh, to, the to my presentation. And um, yeah, as I was mentioning, yeah, <coughs> uh, yesterday I did the first part. Here in the second part of the presentation, we'll talk about the uh, new effectors uh, which were implemented in, into MoGraph, into the MoGraph system, ecosystem. And uh, we will start off with the push apart effector, which is a very uh, fun effector to uh, play with. And yeah, and I will um, go right into cinema and show you some uh, sample um, sample scenes and uh, do some live demoing. So let's right get into it. Um, so um, before I show this, let me show you just the most simple example uh, one can think of. Um, so what does the push apart effector do? Say you have your uh, cloner set up and uh, you cloned a bunch of clones and you have different scales, different positions and whatnot. And maybe let's do this sphere a little bit smaller. And as you can see, uh, sometimes you have those overlapping clones which you want to avoid. Um, um, so uh, in this case, the push apart effector uh, in its um, simplest um, uh, way of working um, does exactly that. It pushes those clones uh, from each other. So I'll select the cloner object and so and call the push apart effector, which you can find here. And uh, by default, it's set to a radius 100. But uh, if you take a look at our sphere, it has a radius of 41.3. Let's put it to 40, so it's an even number. Um, so here, you can set the radius. Uh, of the push apart effect, and let's set it to 40, and maybe raise the iterations a little bit higher. So as you can see, uh, those clones or those spheres are not overlapping each other anymore. Um, so if we, if I, <coughs> sorry, if I put down the strength parameter, you can see exactly how this uh, effect uh, affects my uh, clones. And of course, you can play around with the radius and push them much more apart, but um, yeah. So, and like I said, that's the most uh, uh, simple uh, usage scenario for this push apart effector. And if we get back to my basic example, uh, let me turn off everything. So here I have a cloner object, which is set um, to the grid array mode. And then I apply the random effector, which changes the position and the scale of my clones. Uh, then I think I've used the plane effector, re effector, which I will come to later in my presentation. And then I used uh, two push apart effectors because the push apart effector not only just has this uh, push apart mode, but it has uh, uh, several other modes. And uh, one of the other modes uh, is called scale apart. So if I turn, uh, turn on these two um, push apart effectors, you can see now my uh, spheres or my clones are. Uh, really evenly and organically um, distributed on this uh, on this plane or on this space. So if I tune down the strength strength of those, you can see the effect. So that's how they were looking before. And if I raise the strength parameter, you can see um, 
you get this nice, evenly laid out uh, uh, clone, clones. And um, so if I uh, saw this, uh, if I saw this, uh, if I played around with the push apart effect the first time, I immediately thought about, um, thought, um, about this um, color blindness, um, color blindness um, test. I'm not sure if you guys know that, but if I turn off uh, my setup, I guess you will probably recognize it. So, uh, yeah, there it is. So it's like, uh, th that's like a, um, a, 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 I should say, usual test how color blindness, uh, blindness uh, is tested. You have a bunch of, uh, bunch of spheres. They are color-coded in uh, green, red, blue, uh, whatever, uh, whichever uh, color blindness test it is. So, um, and exactly, and uh, as you can see, the setup is uh, rather simple. I'll just um, use the shader effector to um, change the color of my clones. Oh, uh, the picture is missing. Let's see if we can find it. So my textures seem to be, that should be. So there it is. And let's get rid of this guy and see if that works. Ah, there it is. So I'm, I'm using a shader effector to color my uh, clones um, based on this image, which you saw here. And then I'm uh, randomizing a little bit uh, the position and the scales of those guys, and then using, lastly, the push apart effector, uh, which uh, needs some time. Yep, there it is. So to get this nice, uh, oh, it should render. Why doesn't it render? One sec. Ah, yeah, to get this nice, evenly laid out uh, clones. So that was one uh, basic example of the push apart effector, which was this one here. Uh, another example uh, is this one where I took, a, took the picture of a pineapple and distributed my clones. Um, so this is this scene here. So let me turn on uh, one by one uh, all the um, all the effectors I used for this uh, scene. So here I have a cloner object, and I'm cloning onto a plane uh, with uh, how many clones? 3,500. And then I'm using uh, several shader effectors. Uh, the first one uh, uses the uh, black and white image of my pineapple, as you can see here. Um, sorry, here, exactly. It uses uh, the alpha channel of my uh, pineapple image to uh, get rid of all the, uh, all the clones which are not belonging to the uh, pineapple, uh, uh, the black part of the uh, pineapple image. And um, then I'm using a second uh, shader effector to colorize um, my clones according to that image. And uh, after that, I'm using, again, two uh, push apart effectors the first one is scaling those uh, clones apart, and the second one is pushing them apart to give this nice picture. And then I think I've um, changed the scale of my clones so they appear a little bit bigger. And then lastly, I think I hit those really uh, big guys up here and there. So boom, they're gone. And uh, to get to this final picture, let's see if it renders. Yes, it does. So that's how this uh, pineapple image uh, was done. And as you can see, it's not, not a uh, complicated setup. Um, and with the push apart effect, it was really as easy to achieve um, this image. So let's take a look at the uh, next example. Yeah, that was, a, uh, that was a nice scene to play with. So what I did here, let me open that scene. And let's just play it. Oh. None of the effectors are on. Let's turn all of them on to see the final effect. So exactly. Uh, so what did I do here? Basically, um, I'm using a couple of those push apart effectors. And they are restricted to uh, single letters. Um, as you can see up here, I have three of those push apart effectors. And the first one is influencing uh, the letter P, the second one letter S, and the third one letter U. And as you can also see here, down here, I animated some of the values. Uh, first, the value. Uh, oh, yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. 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 Um, 
made a mistake. Those are not push uh, apart effectors, those are plane effectors. So, and those plane effectors are influencing uh, single letters, as I was mentioning. So, um, and like I said, I animated uh, those letters along the x axis and scaled them a little bit. So, if I let me just uh, turn off one sec, exactly, uh, turn off the, the the push apart effector. So as you can see, that's like the basic animation I did with those uh, three uh, with those uh, three letters. And um, yeah, as you see, it's not uh, very uh, interesting. But as soon as you uh, introduce uh, the push apart effector, um, you see that those uh, single letters, as they are animated, are uh, pushing away from each other and give this nice, nice effect. And uh, last but not least, I'm also using two delay effectors to give this nice ease in, ease out motion. So, um, yeah, exactly. And that's uh, how this scene uh, was done. And I'm also using a tracer object here, um, which I sweeped. But I mean, yeah, for this uh, demonstration, I don't have to turn on the sweep. So uh, to, give those, um, to give those letters also a speed line effect, and, uh, which helps with the uh, overall um, effect. So um, yeah, that's how um, this scene was done. And I mean, all I had to do is uh, animate a couple of uh, parameters, and it looks like a very uh, sophisticated uh, animation, which um, yeah, which was very easy to set up. So um, one sec, I need some <laughs> water. All right, uh, on to the. Uh, next slide. So, ah, we're already um, uh, going to the going to the second effector, which was added to the uh, um, MoGraph ecosystem, and it's called Reeffector, which has, um, I should say, like which at first I thought, um, which uh, where I wasn't really sure what's uh, what's the what's the purpose of this uh, effector, but then after after uh, exploring it a little bit, um, I would say it's a really versatile and interesting effector um, where I will uh, show you a couple of um, uh, examples. So um, going back to cinema and opening a basic example. Uh, maybe beforehand I should just make one from scratch so it's really visible what this um, effector does. So here I have a uh, bunch of matrix matrices let's uh, give it a give it a random effector and maybe also change the color and maybe use also a step effector on this guy exactly where I'm changing uh, the scale of a couple of those clones down here so let's say you have a you have a MoGraph scene and you uh, used a couple of effectors on your uh, on your clones, and now you want to reset some of the parameters uh, uh, on your clones. So, um, and this is basically what you can. I mean, this is one of the use, uh, uses um, of the reeffector. So if I may show it to you, um, MoGraph here uh, in the MoGraph menu, reeffector. So um, here. Uh, here are the options uh, for the for the um, for the reeffector, and is resetting now as uh, already some of those parameters are uh, turned on. The position and the scale. Uh, I mean, I didn't apply it any rotation effect, and uh, also the weight. So if I turn every, every one of those parameters off, you see uh, nothing changes. Um, here's my reeffector in the effectors list, and now I can. Uh, reset some of the parameters for those clones. So let's say I want to reset um, the clones to the basic color which, where I started from. Let's say I also want to uh, reset the scale, but uh, keep the position. So this is, uh, like I said, uh, one of the uh, usage, uh, uses of this reeffector. It uh, resets some of those parameters. And after that, of course, I can uh, let's take another effector. So after this re-effector, maybe I want to apply a shader effector, which uh, changes the colors. Uh, let's put a noise in here, make it a little bit smaller. 
Uh, let me set this one off and maybe animate it. So you have basically now a fresh start when it comes to the color parameters of those clones and can uh, change them uh, after applying uh, this re-effector. So that was uh, one simple example. Let's go uh, to another example. Here I have a scene where I basically uh, did that. So I have, um, oh, yeah, where I did that, but I did it also a little bit more. So let's see, I have here some matrices arranged in a grid, uh, applied a random effector and a, a shader effector. So now I'm using uh, two of those re-effectors, and I call them state one and state two. So if I turn on state one, you can see I uh, res did a reset on the position and on the scale and on the color of my uh, clones. And I'm also applying a step effector. But this step effector is not in the list of my uh, matrix uh, effectors list, but it's here in the uh, re-effectors li uh, list for effectors. Um, so I'm uh, resetting some of the parameters, but at the same time influencing uh, my clones with the step effector. And then I also apply the fall off um, on this uh, one re effector. So I can, so if I say that that was like uh, where I started from, and now I'm applying uh, this re effector uh, on those clones, including a step effector which is uh, put here into the effectors list. And that's one state. And uh, here I have another state or another re-effector, which I called state two. So in this another state, um, I am resetting position, scale, rotation, and color, and at the same time applying two new effectors. And I also apply the fall off uh, on this re-effector. So this means now I have this two different states or two different sets of effectors uh, which can influence my clones. So that's like uh, the second one. and that's the first one. So that's a very nice way of um, combining and uh, combining uh, effectors, uh, resetting some values to a, um, to a specific state, uh, and then uh, go from there. So um, that was another use of the re-effector. Let's take a look. Oops, I'm sorry. So that was one basic example. Another basic example is this one here. I called that effector instance instancing. So what does that mean? Let me open up the scene and we can take a look. So here I'm using uh, this re-effector as a deformer, which is a very nice, uh, which is an additional, uh, additional uh, uh, option or parameter where, um, <coughs> where I'm not uh, forced to use the re-effector as an effector in a, in a cloner setup, but I can just use it as a deformer. And uh, what I did here, let me turn off those uh, jiggle effectors, is that I, um, here in my re-effector, I have uh, put in three other effectors, plain, random, and uh, a shader effector. And they're going through my capsule here. So this is my capsule, here's my re-effector, and the re-effector has those three ed uh, additional effectors uh, in it. And so, and let's, as I was mentioning, I've set this uh, one to deform points. So, if I'm going through, okay, let me turn off that sphere, so it's really busy, uh, visible. So, uh, my re-effector goes through my uh, capsule and is changing the position uh, uh, of the points on this uh, on this capsule and gives me this uh, rather interesting object, and. What I did then is um, I just duplicated my re-effector, and uh, now I'm using the same effector stack, uh, namely the shader, random, and plane effector, on another object. So that means if I turn on my sphere, and maybe also the jiggle, which gives a nice effect. So now you can see I can uh, take those effectors, have a single animation or a single fall off, but I can use it independently. Uh, in time and space. So that means if I have, let's take another object, let's take a cube, give it some segments. So instead of, um, exactly, so instead of uh, duplicating uh, all those effectors, I just have to make a, a, duplication, uh, a duplicate of my uh, re effector down there. And now, exactly, I can 
uh, use the same effectors on different objects in different, um, in a, on a different time and, and in space. So on this uh, third re-effector, I can just change my keyframes so it comes as the last guy. So first the capsule, then the spheres, and then uh, the box. So I think before, uh, I think you, you would have to um, take this effector stack, stack and duplicate it a couple of times and uh, then uh, apply fall off on all those three, uh, on all those, um, how, how much would it be, nine effectors, apply all of them a, a linear fall off, uh, which you don't have to do now. So you, now you can just use uh, this re-effector, put all those into the re-effectors uh, effectors list, and then go wild with that. So that's a really nice way of, I mean, like I said, I called it effectors instancing, um, but I'm sure there uh, could be other names for it, but uh, makes, I mean, basically it gives you a lot of flexibility uh, and um, you can reuse your, your effectors uh, on different objects. Uh, yeah, and which of course makes your hierarchy uh, much less cluttered, uh, much less cluttered. So that was another example for the re-effector. Let's take a look at, oh, that was it. I think I had a third one. Let me see. Yes, exactly, re-effector versioning. So that's not mentioned uh, here in my presentation, but nevertheless, I will open up the scene because um, I think that's also a great use, usage scenario for the re-effector. So what do I have here? I have um, a matrix uh, object arranged in a, in a grid. Let me turn off those guys, exactly. And then I'm um, using two re-effectors, which you can find here in the effectors list. And they have those, um, uh, they have those four effectors called time, uh, plane, random, and push apart effector uh, in the effectors list. So if I turn those guys on, as you can see, uh, my clones are moving, ha have a different scale, have a different color. Um, so what happens now if I want to change some of the uh, parameters to do a second or a third version of this setup. So uh, I have like a couple of setups which, you can, which I can evaluate and pick the, the best one from. And that's, I think, a scenario where I, this uh, re-effector also shows its strengths. So what I did here is, uh, let me go down here. As you can see, in my first uh, re-effector, I've changed the strengths of some of those um, uh, other effectors, and now I can turn off uh, the first one and turn on the second one, where I also changed some of these guys. So I'm still using the same effectors, but I'm changing the strength uh, of those and don't have to make duplicates of them and can see and uh, can evaluate which one of those versions are probably uh, the best one for my project. So that was version two, that's version one, and of course, you can go ahead and make a third, fourth, and so on uh, uh, iteration or version of this uh, uh, of how those effectors uh, influence your clones. So, um, yeah, that was version. Um, that was my uh, the, the re-effector versioning scene. So let's see if I have another. Uh, so I have another uh, scene, which is also very, uh, I think, uh, very nice. So what I did here is that, I, uh, or the, the basic, basic, uh, I should say, the basic functionality of this scene is that um, I have an effector stack which um, is influencing my clones or my matrices, but I can now use different falloffs uh, on a single stack of effectors. So what I mean by that, let me show you uh, how it would lo look like if I would take this matrix object and put those effectors one by one into the list. One sec, something like this. So um, now if I want to have a fall off uh, on those guys, and especially the same fall off, uh, or different or several fall offs, um, that wouldn't really work. So for example, I could uh, activate a linear fall off on all those four effectors, but now I'm, I'm stuck with just one single fall off type. 
But if I'm using the re-effector and a couple of uh, duplicates of those, I can have the same effect as stuff, uh, stack influencing the clones, but with several follows, which is a very nice thing to do or have. So if I get rid of those effectors and turn those three re-effectors on, so my first one, as you can see, oh, let me turn them on also here. So first, the first one, as you can see, has this uh, torus fall off. The second one, um, let me see here, is that already turned? Sorry, one sec, let me see, is it turned on? Yes, it is. Uh, it has a spherical fall off, and the third one has a box fall off. So I have the same effect, but I have different fall offs, and I can just uh, mix and match them. So if I want to build a specific type of fall off um, out of those uh, basic fall off shapes, I can do that now. And uh, that's a very, very convenient thing to have and um, gives also great flexibility in, in the way you're, you're animating uh, your clones or uh, using falloffs in general. Um, yeah, so that was, that was a couple of, uh, couple of examples for the, for the re-effector, which I find like very, very versatile and uh, very interesting effect in general. So uh, now coming to the cloner object itself, there are some additions uh, which I think are very nice and uh, helpful in the day-to-day workflow. So let me open, sorry, let me open the scene. So the first uh, addition to the cloner is that we now uh, have, a, a f let me say one, two, three, a fifth, uh, uh, a fifth mode, um, which is called Honeycomb Beret, and as the name says, it arranges your clones in this Honeycomb Beret uh, or shape, uh, instead of, um, for example, the Grid Array, which just has this uh, basic box uh, shape or, or plane shape uh, to distribute your, your, your clones along. So as I, as I was mentioning here, this new mode called Honeycomb Beret takes your clones and uh, uh, gives this nice offsetted way of um, distributing them or creating them. So of course I can go here and change uh, the count of, uh, of, this, uh, of this mode. Uh, I can offset those clones uh, and I also can do some variation on those. Let me go a couple of, do some couple of undos. Yeah, exactly. So for example, I can give it a slight offset variation. So it's not like, uh, it's not, it has some irregularity to it and looks a little bit more organic if I like, don't have to. Um, so that's a really nice addition. Let me go back a couple of times. That's a nice addition uh, to the cloner object, but uh, there's more. So uh, let me open up the next scene. Let me see. So that's this one here. So uh, what did I do here? And what kind of addition uh, can we find here is that um, we now have the possibility. Uh, let me turn on. Uh, so why don't we see anything? There we see something. Let me see. Ah, yeah. So um, I have a landscape object here, which I where I applied a polygon reduction and uh, also a formula deformer to set um, to scale it down on the y-axis. And then I'm doing a little bit of smoothing. So I have this nice irregular uh, plane object where I'm cloning onto, like so. And I already turned it on. Uh, it's called. Um, uh, down here, the parameter is called Enable Scaling. And what it basically does is it takes your clones and um, scales it uh, according to the polygon size. So what that means is that if you have a bigger polygon up here, your clone will stay or get bigger. And if you have a smaller polygon, uh, your uh, clone will uh, resize or rescale accordingly. So this is uh, how this scene was done. And then as an small addition to it. Let me turn off the landscape object. Uh, I think I also changed uh, exactly. Here I've also uh, changed the color. Um, 
of those clones according to their size. And for that, I'm using um, a MoGraph weight tag. So if I turn off uh, the shader effector up here and maybe uh, give it some contrast by making the scene darker. So now you can see that my uh, bigger clones are brighter and the smaller ones are uh, darker, respectively. So, um, and this was really easy to, to, to do uh, first with this new parameter called uh, enable scaling, uh, which scales down clones based on the polygon size. And then uh, with the MoGraph weight tag, uh, where I've used a little bit of Expresso just to um, go through those clones and uh, ask for how, uh, how big they are, and then um, changed uh, the weights on my clones. And so as you can see, the bigger one has have those uh, yellow weights, so around 100%, and the smaller ones have close to zero. Uh, percent weight. So if I turn on my shader using this MoGraph uh, weight map, um, you get this nice coloring effect. So uh, this is how this scene uh, was done. Let me show you the polygon or the tessellation of the object again. So that was the um, enable scaling or uh, scale clones based on polygon size. Um, let's go to the Next example, which uh, seems like a, a simple option, but can, uh, can be a big help, I guess, in a, in a MoGraph workflow. And this is uh, something which you can find when you set your uh, cloner um, to, to object mode and then put in another cloner. So this is, those are my uh, spheres cloner setup, and I've set the, set the uh, cloner mode to object and put this other cloner uh, set up in. And now you, can, uh, you have another option down here in the distribution modes, uh, which is called Axis. So what it does, it um, copies uh, or attaches clones uh, to the axis of this other cloner setup. And uh, like I was mentioning, I mean, seems like a, a simple, simple addition, but I think that can be very helpful in uh, complex uh, MoGraph setups. So on, let me see, what did I miss? Honeycomb array, we looked at that. Scaling based on polygon size, clone axis mode. Ah, yeah, the form mode, uh, which, I, which can be also called voxelizer. Let me open up an example scene for that. So let's see. So what I have here, let me turn off those guys. We don't need those. So I have here uh, a mouse object uh, where I'm cloning some uh, yeah, where I want to uh, clone some spheres on. So uh, now what you can do instead of just cloning it uh, into the um, base uh, on the volume of this mouse or on the surface or the vertex position, you can now take the object itself and uh, let the clones arrange in a in a in a grid-like fashion. So uh, we can see that if I turn on my cloner object and maybe turn off the mouse. So as you can see, now my clones are uh, cloned into the volume of this mouse. Maybe we should raise uh, or make the sphere a little bit bigger so it's better visible. Also change maybe the number of clones. So yeah, as soon as I'm raising the number of clones, you can see it resembles more and more the shape of my mouse. And um, yeah, and as I was mentioning, I mean, here it's called uh, uh, object mode down here in form, in a form parameter. But uh, as, as I was mentioned, you can also call it uh, the voxelizer effect. So um, just to just to reiterate that, where you can find it. So you set your ob uh, your cloner object to a grid array, and here normally it's set to a cube. Maybe lower the number of clones so we can see that exactly. Maybe lower it even more. So that's what you, oops, one sec. My clo oh, I turned my object on. So this is what you uh, usually get when you set your um, clone mode to grid array. You have this cubic uh, uh, sphere and cylinder form, but now you have this addition called object where you can just, uh, as I was mentioning, 
use uh, an arbitrary uh, polygon object, put it in there, and then um, your clones are uh, distributed in a grid-like fashion into the volume of this uh, object. So let me go revert to saved so we can see the guy. So um, exactly. So um, that was the voxelizing effect. And let's see. Yeah, that would be uh, the end of my talk. But if you guys have a question, um, I can try um, to address it here. Uh, otherwise, I would say thank you very much uh, for listening. Thanks to Maxon for having me. And yeah, see you. Thank you. <laughs>